Welcome to this uh, NPTEL uh, MOOC course on advanced topics in uh, science and technology of uh, concrete systems. Uh, so, this will be part 2 of the uh, module on fluoride induced corrosion and service life of reinforced concrete structures. So, we will uh, focus as we discussed earlier, we will focus on the steel cementitious systems and uh, how the interface plays a role uh, in en enhancing service life. So, we will be talking mainly about the chloride threshold. So, in the previous part 1, we covered chloride diffusion uh, coefficient and uh, today we will talk about chloride threshold. We will be covering mainly how the threshold of the uncoated steel reinforcement can be estimated and then uh, how what will be the effect of corrosion inhibitors and how the uh, what is the effect of coated reinforcement. And through these discussions, we will also cover uh, different type of test methods which are available, uh, which we developed, uh, you know, because all the test method cannot be adopted for all these materials. So, uh, we will see how, uh, what are the challenges associated with different uh, uh, type of steel and then associated testing for chloride threshold. Then we will also cover uh, some tools for service life estimation. So, in today's uh, market, we use uh, you know different type of chemical inhibitors, so corrosion inhibitors, uh, and uh, supplementary cementitious materials, and different type of steels, uh, coated rebars. All these are used in uh, today's market as a measure for enhancing service life. However, we must before we start using these materials in large scale, we must do a test on how really they affect so the uh, diffusion coefficient and chloride threshold. So, in this part, we will focus mainly on the uh, chloride threshold of uh, these different uh, steel cementitious systems. So, uh, first I will talk about uh, accelerated chloride threshold that is that ACT stands for accelerated chloride threshold which was developed for uh, determining chloride threshold of OPC systems without any uh, inhibitors. But we found that there were some challenges in using that test method for systems with chemical admixtures mainly corrosion inhibitors. And later we found that you know when you talk about highly resistive uh, supplementary cementitious systems or for example, limestone calcine clay systems and fly ash in some cases and corrosion inhibitors, it will be not really that easy to adopt uh, this method MACT. So, we had to actually modify the test method and then uh, come up with a, a more suitable test method for uh, you know determining chloride threshold of highly resistive systems. So, I will walk you through these uh, three different uh, testing and the results which we obtain from these tests and how those results actually influence the service life. Now, first uh, accelerated chloride threshold testing, this was originally developed uh, as part of my master's thesis. Uh, then uh, what we used was uh, linear polarization resistance technique and uh, you have this, this uh, test specimen how it looks like and then here you have uh, you know mortar filled uh, mold with the steel specimen inside and you have a uh, an anode and cathode system which is connected to a voltage source and where when you apply 20 volts across this, it is going to drag the chlorides towards the steel from this uh, pond on the top. And what we do is we uh, continuously check the corrosion rate using the technique called the linear polarization resistance and when there is a significant change, we break the specimen right here along this line and then we determine what is the or you know if you talk about here, you will break the specimens along this line and then at right at the uh, uh, you know surface or uh, the mortar which is adjacent to the steel, uh, you know we will check the chloride con concentration of that mortar which will be defined as the chloride threshold. So, you drive the chlorides towards the steel, keep testing the corrosion rate and then break the specimen, when it uh, initiates break the specimens right here and find what is the chloride concentration of the mortar in this region here. And that is defined as the uh, chloride threshold of that particular steel uh, in any system. So, here 
how do you do that is linear how do you determine this corrosion rate is uh, by uh, conducting this linear polarization resistant test or LPR in short where you actually take a specimen and then you apply some potential very small uh, potential. So, originally when you talk about specimen you have something called open circuit potential or you know E core and from there you push the specimen or you induce uh, you know uh, some potential so that the specimen the uh, current you will see that you know as the specimen ideally this should start from here, but not that is not the real case anyway. So, you push the specimen here and then you start sweeping from here till like this up all the way up to here. And then what you do is you take the slope when it crosses the uh, 0 uh, current line or current density and then that slope indicates the corrosion rate. So, the higher the slope means that the corrosion rate is higher. So, like this after every uh, you know uh, application of voltage to drive the chlorides towards the steel what you will do is you will do this linear polarization resistant test and you will determine the corrosion rate or inverse polarization resistance 1 by uh, rp. So, which is actually equivalent to a corrosion rate. So, then you plot this 1 by rp or e, uh, corrosion rate uh, here you know this represents the corrosion rate. So, you can see that these are all different corrosion rates which have been obtained after every application of or after driving some chlorides towards the steel using an applied electrical potential. And then you we came up with a statistical method on how to detect that there is a when there is corrosion happening. So, you can see that all these numbers are actually more or less similar and then you also determine there is something we define as a stable corrosion rate where that means the corrosion rate when there is no significant corrosion happening or the when there is only passive corrosion I mean no active corrosion happening. Then after some time you will see that these are all as, as you go towards the right the amount of chloride at the steel surface is slowly increasing. Now, at this point you will see that there is something happening and you have a significant increase in the corrosion rate and what it means is there is something happened to the amount of chlorides at the steel surface and we define that this happens when the uh, chloride concentration at the steel surface achieved or re, uh, reached the chloride threshold. Then so what you do you just 2, 3 extra tests you have to do so that you confirm that this is actually uh, you know corrosion has initiated and it is continuing to corrode. At this point you take you open the specimen autopsy the specimen and determine the amount of chloride at the uh, steel surface. So, for example, you open the specimen right here and then you, you open it and determine how much is the chloride at that surface. So, by that way we determine the chloride threshold and you can see the chloride threshold for different type of steel can be very different. For example, these two are the typical steels which are used in the market and then we also had a you know special type of corrosion resistant steel uh, which we call micro composite steel and then you also have stainless steel rebars of different types. In India we do not use the stainless steel rebars much, but uh, mostly we use this type of uh, you know A706 or A615 type steel or steel which has very similar chloride threshold. So, point of this slide is that the type of steel which we use will definitely uh, is an influencing parameter on our service life because they will exhibit different chloride threshold. So, if we do not use stainless steel because of the cost implications we can at least use some type of corrosion resistant steel which will actually provide a larger chloride threshold and or exhibit a larger chloride threshold and hence uh, longer uh, service life. However, this method uh, you know in uses that potential application to drive the chlorides towards the steel. Hence, it has some limitations when you talk about systems which has corrosion inhibitors or any uh, uh, complex system where there is lot of negatively charged ions which actually helps in uh, controlling the corrosion. Or in other words when you do a test the test itself should not change the property of the steel cementitious interface. If you apply the voltage 
that means it is actually driving more chlorides towards the uh, steel surface and in that process it is also driving other negatively charged ions to the towards the steel surface and if you do that what you are doing is at the beginning of the test you have a different steel cementitious interface the property is different and after some time you will see that the uh, material has changed because of the application of the voltage which is not a right way of testing. In other words the test method should not alter the steel cementitious system. So, we went uh, you know and also there are requirements of you know how assessing the chloride threshold or the effectiveness of different type of inhibitors which are available in the market. So, this is just a picture showing how these inhibitors work corrosion inhibitors mainly used for new type of structure where these chemicals or corrosion inhibitors are mixed with the new concrete and then they are supposed to form a protective film at the steel surface or they are supposed to control the rate of half cell reactions. What they do is they consume the oxygen and then if sufficient oxygen is not available for the half cell reactions then you will not have corrosion. So, that is two different way of protecting the steel by use of different type of corrosion inhibitors. Now, we uh, you know then the market there are lot of inhibitors available in the markets and when you talk about service life you have to guarantee that these inhibitors will work after some period of time and that means they will work when there is a possibility of corrosion initiation which is probably after 20 or 30 years or in other words these inhibitors start functioning after 20, 30 years. So, there is a need for we cannot wait for 20, 30 years to check whether an inhibitor will work. So, we have to have a short term test method which could be let us say 2 to 3 months or even up to 6 months in during which time we can actually see whether the inhibitors are of good quality or are they really effective in controlling corrosion or in extending the ons onset of uh, initiation onset of corrosion. Now, so, what we did was from a ACT accelerated chloride threshold we went to modified ACT. What are the modifications which we did? So, this is on the on the left side you see a sketch or schematic of the uh, ACT test setup where we used to have a 20 volt uh, application of 20 volts to drive the chlorides towards the steel from the reservoir. This blue lines indicate the reservoir. Now, what we did is we wanted to avoid this application of uh, voltage to drive the chlorides. So, we reduced the cover depth a little bit and we did not use the uh, uh, voltage and this is mainly from uh, Jay Chandran's work. And so, what we did was reduce the cover, avoid the voltage and at the same time increase the chloride concentration of I mean concentration of chlorides in this solution. So, with all these we could actually uh, in a, you know get the testing done in 2 to 3 times. One more thing to note here is when you talk about corrosion inhibitors you are talking about a system which will resist corrosion for a higher amount of chlorides. That means, it is going to take longer period of time for achieving that time. So, test method will actually be longer if you uh, compare with the system with no corrosion inhibitor. So, this was the challenge and we have to do everything in short period of time. So, uh, here you can see so the chloride will penetrate from here through diffusion will penetrate steel is here then then we will have the testing and then once the uh, sufficient chloride is reached you will be monitoring like in the ACT test method we will be monitoring the uh, amount of chloride at the at this plane at this plane here and then do the same test. I am going to show you how uh, how that similar method as we did in the uh, like this. So, similar way we will do the same test and then you see how uh, when that significant increase the significant increase in the uh, corrosion current or inverse polarization resistance and based on which you will do the similar test after that. After this we will just do some chemical test on the mortar powder which is collected from the uh, adjacent to the steel uh, in the specimen. So, mortar powder from this level and then do the test. So, with this uh, we determine the chloride threshold of uh, without any inhibitor that is plain uh, mortar 
which is more or less similar to the values reported in literature not that different from this blue and black I would say it is look at the scatter also. And then you have uh, anodic inhibitor and bipolar inhibitors which are widely available in the market today. So, we tested and then we found that anodic inhibitor exhibits slightly uh, higher uh, average value and also uh, when you talk about uh, bipolar that is also slightly higher uh, you know in the chloride threshold. You can see that there is a you know the band if you look at here, here this is the band. So, there is an increase in the chloride threshold when we use uh, bipolar inhibitors which is uh, in the market widely used in the market today. Now, how, uh, so idea here is we have now a test method which can determine the uh, chloride threshold for systems uh, in about 3 to 4 months. So, that 3 to 4 months for the systems with corrosion inhibitors and this was done in OPC uh, based systems or ordinary Portland cement based systems. Now, there are other systems available in the market which I will show you later. Now, with that uh, OPC systems with corrosion inhibitors how the this increase in chloride threshold here what it means to the service life or how it is influencing the service life. So, you can see here if you have an OPC system without any corrosion inhibitor you may have 9 years of service life. Remember that there are some assumptions for the entire analysis. So, it is not you know for the same system how it is differing that is what the point here is. And if you use a calcium nitrite based inhibitor you can have a life of about 18.4 years which is almost double compared to 9.2 years. And if you use bipolar inhibitor you can have a life of about 30 years. So, there is a significant increase from uh, in using a corrosion inhibitor you can easily get about 2 to 3 times. Only catch here is you have to make sure that these inhibitors are actually used in the right dosage. So, that is something here where we looked at how change in the dosage which will influence other properties of the concrete. Because when we talk about corrosion inhibitors usually the trend is to check the effect of inhibitors on the corrosion properties. But we also should look at how that material which is mixed with the concrete is influencing the properties of the cover concrete or the concrete uh, you know uh, core crit also. Because you are going to mix that with everything right both cover and core concrete are going to be uh, having this corrosion inhibitors. So, we looked at one example here is an inhibitor with both amine and nitrate it was mixed and then this graph this plot uh, box here indicates uh, with the in, uh, inhibitor at the recommended dosage as recommended by the manufacturer and when you do not have any inhibitors this is the graph more or less these are same there is no statistically significant difference between the gray box and the green box it is more or less same uh, compressive strength. However, when the recommended dosage was changed to less than uh, to uh, minus 20 and minus 40 percent than of the recommended dosage and plus 20 and plus 40 of the recommended dosage there was significant difference or reduction not just different significant reduction in the compressive strength. Now, this is not something which is good. So, you must check the effect of these uh, integral inhibitors on the properties of the concrete. The first property which anybody would check is compressive strength. So, do that test first, but we also found that there are it may also affect the uh, durability related properties or transport properties. One example here I am showing is the water sorptivity index. So, here how we do is you take uh, this uh, disc of uh, uh, concrete and then you uh, put that uh, place that in a small water bath or uh, uh, not immerse, but just place like this what is shown in the picture. And then you weigh the uh, you know uh, see how much water is absorbed by the uh, because of this option uh, by the concrete so, uh, the, uh, the this concrete disc. So, what you see here is you have the control that means without any inhibitor and the recommended dosage of inhibitor for this case of inhibitor A you see significant increase in the uh, significant increase in the uh, water sorptivity index. So, this is not something which is good. So, you have to see 
and we could find some other inhibitors where there is no change. So, for example, here you can see there is no change in the water sorptivity index, but it is not in a good category concrete anyway. So, you have to see all these things have to be uh, thought through and tested before uh, we really accept and use corrosion inhibitors, but definitely it has an improvement um, and it can actually enhance the uh, uh, corrosion uh, resistance or chloride threshold uh, in particular. Okay. Now, today the, so that was about the uh, we first talked about uh, ordinary Portland cement system without any inhibitors, then we talked about how we can check OPC systems with inhibitors. Now, the new trend in the market is using a lot of SEMs. Okay, and also low water cement ratio, uh, SEMs, low water cement ratio and maybe we will also use SEMs with corrosion inhibitors. So, things are get becoming more and more complex. Now, here when you talk about SEMs, the main property which is changing is the resistivity of the uh, concrete system. So, you can see here steel and then you have the cover crete which is now with SEM. Now, you have a, if you have very high and most of the time when you do the testing, your uh, testing systems are kept here uh, outside the or the electrodes which you talk about your it is all actually outside the concrete. Now, what the property of this concrete here will actually influence the measurements which you take when you talk about electrochemical testing. So, what we are looking at is how this resistivity of this concrete here actually affects the uh, testing and the results. So, what we found was the earlier test methods were not able to uh, reliably estimate the chloride threshold. So, there was a need for a development of a new test method which will kind of take care of this uh, resistivity of the concrete cover. So, here you see OPC concrete this is in log scale. So, here OPC concrete you can see about 10 uh, you know kilo ohm centimeter is the resistivity fly ash you have something from there, but a large range you know that means there are fly ash concretes which can have high resistivity and most OPC concrete it would not really go to, I mean uh, it will be very difficult even if you use a very low water cement ratio you may not see very high resistivity for the uh, OPC based concrete. If you talk about slag again you have something very similar to fly ash and if you have talk about silica fume actually the lower band is if there is no uh, you know uh, the resistivity is much higher compared to fly ash or slag. If you talk about LC 3 it is all in a completely different uh, range you are a one order of magnitude different. So, you have very wide range of resistivity when you talk about different type of SEMs or concretes with different type of SEM. So, we are trying to develop a simple test method where you can actually uh, cast the specimen in a relatively easy manner and at the same time get a reliable estimate of chloride threshold. So, uh, yeah SEMs can lead to high uh, resistivity. Now, so we started with ACT and then we modified that for corrosion inhibitors and now we are modifying the test for uh, incorporating highly resistive SEMs. Uh, concrete with highly resistive SEMs. Now, you can see this is a simplified uh, you know specimen just a uh, lollipop type specimen cylinder specimen with one single rebar. Now, you know you may be aware of a test method called ASTM G109 which is uh, having a specimen will be something like this which has three rebars like this and then you look at what happens between this rebar and this rebars. So, where you talk about a macro cell corrosion, but what we have found recently is that you know when you talk about uh, uh, highly resistive systems, you do not have you know exchange of uh, you know current across these, because this material here is highly resistive in nature. So, what you do is you usually see micro cell or uh, corrosion will be happening on the same bar there is no you know electrical circuit between different bars in when you talk about highly resistive system. So, this this uh, re, uh, you know specimen with single rebar will really work uh, for uh, you know testing uh, highly resistive system. So, this is how the specimen looks like. So, you have some portions here are coated 
you know for defining the exposed region which is this portion here which is this region. So, this is your exposure uh, region. Okay. Now, similar test you have a you know similar test setup, but the uh, technol technique used is different here we were we are using uh, elect, uh, you know uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy instead of linear polarization resistance, because linear polarization resistance uh, even though there uh, you know it is uh, difficult to there are some techniques which are not really working when you talk about steel cementitious system, but in an aqueous system it might work. So, here we found that our resistance is very different. So, this is the uh, electrochemical uh, impedance uh, spectroscopy technique and how the Nyquist plot look like. You can see here this is the plot very small plot for OPC type systems. This is expanded here uh, this, this, this portion here you can see that the range is only up to 350 over here it is about 350. Now, when you talk about fly ash based concrete or LC 3 based systems you are seeing much different the curve is completely different then range you are talking about is also completely different where because of the high resistivity uh, of the uh, binder system. Now, how do you use this technique to determine the corrosion rate? So, essentially in the previous slides also I have told that inverse uh, polarization resistance is what we try to obtain and which is uh, related to the corrosion rate. So, here you have an equivalent circuit which has one of the component as uh, polarization resistance. So, from these what you do you collect this EIS data and then fit for this particular electric equivalent uh, electrical circuit and then you determine by curve fitting you determine what is the RP. Once you determine the RP then you can use the uh, old uh, you know the other method statistical approach on determining whether the corrosion has initiated or not. So, here you can see a schematic of this uh, diagram here this portion here this much is actually representing the binder and then this right side of this is representing the steel uh, steel cementitious uh, or that interface region. Okay. And then by curve fitting you you determine what is the polarization resistance. Now, once you get the polarization resistance like that like the same curve I showed earlier you determine uh, when there is a significant increase in the RP and then at this point you break the specimen and then you so you split the specimen across this line and then you will see the uh, rebar there and then you take the mortar from inside the or the mortar which is just touching the steel rebar and then you determine the chloride threshold of that mortar powder and which is defined as the chloride threshold. And likewise we determine chloride threshold for OPC it was important we, we had to determine this because you have to get something which is to uh, verify the testing procedure right. So, you have OPC which is more 0.4 is kind of widely uh, you know accepted a number for OPC system and PFA or fly ash based system has slightly uh, low chloride threshold and LC 3 has uh, much lower chloride threshold uh, when you talk about I mean uh, different uh, using this SACT uh, method I am calling S for simplified. Uh, so, now if you are actually looking at only the chloride threshold what uh, you will see is that uh, you know you may end up in not using this concrete and not using this concrete which is not a right way because we have to use these two concretes for uh, looking at the uh, you know long life and uh, more greener approach because we are you know industry is changing from OPC to other sort other types of uh, uh, cement systems. Now, based on now, we have determined the chloride threshold, we have determined uh, the diffusion coefficient for various types of systems and using the determined values we looked at okay, how these things actually affect the service life of a, a real structure. So, we picked up one example uh, then looked at actual cover depth which is there in the real structures and then we looked at uh, you know put in these uh, input as input parameters and also m was also used diffusion coefficient and chloride threshold m like i mentioned 0 0.2 0 0.5 and 0 0.7 for these three types of uh, opc pf fly ash and lc3 based systems 
chloride threshold also for these systems were used and we found that the service life can be very significantly different for these three type of systems. And so, here you look at although the uh, you know the chloride threshold of L C 3 was lower than significantly lower than that of P F A, there is not much difference between the uh, you know service life of fly ash and L C 3. What it means is you should not discard a particular cement just by looking at the chloride threshold. You have to look at how the threshold and the diffusion coefficient influence the service life because here LC3 system has much lower diffusion coefficient and a low uh, chloride threshold. But the synergistic effect like you know the positive effect due to a lower diffusion coefficient and a negative effect due to a lower chloride threshold you know you have to see which is the what is that net effect. So, that can be uh, you know seen through this uh, you know uh, cumulative distribution curves. Now, uh, so the we just kind of we can look at also ranking these different materials for uh, M 30 you can say P F A will give you longer life than uh, L C 3 systems which will be much longer than the OPC system. So, if you look here for one thing if you can see like you know here if I draw a vertical line here. So, I can say if you look at an average service life not in a probabilistic sense. So, I can draw a line sorry I can draw a line here and I can see this could be around 10 years for OPC whereas, I can design a concrete system with either fly ash or uh, LC 3 and it can have a life of about you know this much maybe 60 and 80 years something like that. So, it is possible to design long I mean uh, durable structures even if your chloride threshold could be low. For example, here we see that chloride threshold or uh, fly ash and L C 3 are lower than that of O P C, but that is not uh, really a concern uh, when you talk about a uh, you know synergistic effect of both threshold and diffusion coefficient. Now, we also have other way of ways of uh, you know enhancing the uh, corrosion resistance of uh, concrete systems and one way is by uh, using a coating material. However, if you do not use the uh, you know if you do not apply the coating properly or if you do not handle the rebars coated rebars properly at site you may actually um, you know end up in having a lower chloride uh, service life than what you would have without the coating. So, I am going to demonstrate some of these issues again we should remember that the what I am showing is uh, issues where uh, the rebars are handled in a poor way or in a uh, not an adequate manner it is very roughly handled and the coatings are not of high quality, but unfortunately this is the case in many construction sites. So, it is very important to discuss this. Now, you can see here you have you are talking about you know bending of rebars. So, this uh, you know we usually bend the rebars at the construction site, but you know epoxy coated rebars are not supposed to be bent at the site. They are supposed to be bent before you apply the epoxy coating, but uh, as a practice this is not being done. So, when you talk about this bending at site you are using a metallic tool and you have a uh, epoxy which will get pinched or damaged wherever you actually hold uh, that rebar with this uh, bending tool or lever. Now, also if the quality of the epoxy is not that great then you can actually form cracks or at wherever it is bent and if the cracks is there then definitely this will lead to something called crevice corrosion. So, uh, this here something like this here you have a cracked epoxy layer here and here and what will happen is this region will form there will be uh, very uh, there will be crevice corrosion happening at that uh, underneath this epoxy layer or we can even call it under film corrosion. Now, if this happens usually the practice is you apply one more coating one more layer of epoxy, but uh, that is also not uh, really uh, effective uh, to do that. Now, the one more picture which shows you can see here in this picture there is lot of scratches on these rebars all along the length. This is from a real site and here you can see rebars which are bent and after some days this will get filled up with more concrete and you will have 
uh, very serious uh, premature corrosion in these cases. So, the takeaway here is it is more dangerous to use damaged epoxy coated steel than unconventional uh, uh, uncoated than conventional uh, coated rebars because you are actually uh, and it is also more costly to use this coating. So, you put the coating and then uh, you get an inferior product which is not really an advisable thing to do. This is an example from another bridge uh, in Florida where they, this was just 5 years uh, after the construction you have significant peeling off uh, the epoxy and then corrosion uh, you can very clearly see that on the picture. Now, how and why this happens is when you talk about scratching uh, when you drag this rebars at site you scratch and then you can very clearly see this is actually a specimen which is extracted from a mortar prism after about 1 year of exposure and you can see that the corrosion happens only on these and a little bit over here, but this is very fresh very fresh no corrosion at all on these these scratches. So, how it is work uh, how what is the mechanism here is some of the scratched region will start corroding function like an anode whereas, the other regions will help in uh, corroding the anode further or in uh, uh, forcing the localized corrosion to happen. And in the long run what you will probably see is that once this starts this uh, epoxy layer here will be peeled off and then this corrosion will grow underneath the epoxy and then you will have very significant localized uh, un, uh, under film corrosion which is not something easy to test uh, because even these specimens when we tested we were not able to detect this corrosion happening by uh, you know usual methods of electrochemical measurements, but when you open the specimen you see that there is significant uh, corrosion happening because uh, you know that is how uh, because you have this coating it is much more complex than a uh, uncoated rebar. Now, with the uh, data we, what we did is when we uh, you know opened the specimens uh, or autopsy then we took the chloride of we determine the amount of chloride at the rebar surface uh, or in the mortar adjacent to the rebar and then use that number as uh, at because the chloride threshold has to be at least sorry it has to be lower than this 0.22. So, whatever estimation which you see, so if you do not use a new coated rebar you will get a life of something like this okay, which are with an average life of about 75 years, but if you use the coated rebar or poorly coated uh, you know an epoxy coated rebar with uh, poor coating you will get a life of only about uh, 50 years. So, but uh, what it is you should not consider this as 50 because this is not the actual chloride threshold. This is actually chloride threshold for this system is lower than what we saw uh, found because when we tested it was corroded this much. We could not detect the uh, amount of uh, detect the actual initiation of the uh, corrosion. So, significant corrosion was already in place. So, I would say this graph would be something somewhere uh, to the left of the dashed curve. So, if that is the case we really have to think on whether we should use these epoxy coated rebars in many of our structures because uh, to me uh, whatever we learn from the lab and literature this is not uh, a right uh, approach to use this kind of epoxy coated bar especially when we consider the uh, you know type of rough handling of these bars at the site. Now, other type of coating which are in the market today is the uh, cement polymer composite coatings. So, this is a picture from the uh, you know pillar of pier of uh, coastal highway where you know right next to this just about 500 meters you have the seashore I mean it is the sea right on the coast. So, you can see that this uh, coating is actually supposed to be applied on the rebars after the cleaning they are supposed to clean the sand uh, rebars or you sandblast the rebar then only this uh, CPC coating should be applied CPC stands for cement polymer composite. Now, if you do not apply that uh, you know right, uh, with if you apply without cleaning how it is going to affect the service life do we really get the life which we are supposed to get. And another thing also to notice here is when you apply this after the cages are put you will uh, you know uh, have some regions where there is no coating at all. So, here you do not see any coating 
and uh, you have right next to it you have regions with coating. So, there is a region where you can actually form an anode and a cathode. So, a battery can be formed right there where there is a damage in the coating. So, this is also very important to notice that you know whenever you talk about any coating for the rebars you are supposed to have good uh, surface preparation otherwise it may not work properly and handle that coated uh, rebar in a delicate manner. Now, how uh, we did the similar type of testing uh, for determining chloride threshold and what is showing here is you have the V W O without the coating you will have 0.4 which is kind of ok number or is very similar to whatever is reported in literature. When you put uh, when you have with coating it is becoming 0.5 not much different, but the amount of money you spend and time you spend on putting this coating is significant, but you do not really get much higher life because you are actually supposed to get this. That means, with uh, cleaning I mean uh, sandblasting and then apply the coating. So, ideally you should when you talk about uh, you know uh, CPC coating you should get something from here to here, but because you do not uh, if you do not uh, you know apply uh, proper cleaning and this proper surface preparation you will have something this which is not really a useful uh, thing to do and whenever you when you talk about the amount of money invested. So, what do you see like you know the, okay, there is a not significant in increase in the chloride threshold what it means to the service life and in terms of corrosion initiation time. So, if you do a proper job in sandblasting and applying the coating you will let us say a case where you will get about 125 years. What you see is if you uh, apply like you know only sandblasting without any coating you will again get about 100 years, but if you do not uh, sandblast or do not clean the rebar and just apply the coating you will get almost half of the life than what is expected. So, it is a very significant reduction. So, from about 125 to about 70 75 years is what you are actually getting. So, it is a significant reduction uh, in the uh, life or you do not really achieve what is supposed to be there. Okay. Now, uh, some schematic also on how the coated and uh, you know pro properly coated rebar if you have a sand blasted and properly coated rebar after exposing and then we expose the rebar and then autopsied them and then looked at it you can see very rare very you know just some spots here and there indicating lower level of corrosion. But when you have uh, when you apply the coating on the as received rebar that means there is no uh, no cleaning or no sand blasting you see significant amount of corrosion. So, this is not something which is expected. Uh, so, you are we, if you are using CPC coating we must ensure that proper cleaning is done otherwise it is not really advisable to uh, use it. Now, we will see how uh, you know how we can use all this information for uh, service life estimation not with the sophisticated software, but with a simple tool like a nomogram. So, what we did was we created a MATLAB code for uh, using all the input parameters available and the fixed second law of diffusion and uh, based on and then one important thing was this code will actually incorporate will you will be able to input the uh, deviations in various properties which we are talking about. Because when you talk about steel and concrete most of the properties are significant deviation. So, some of the existing software which are widely used, but they do not have uh, they do not take care of the deviation in other words you cannot they have some built in uh, coefficient of variations not the coefficient of variation which uh, you might see on actual site. So, we kind of modified that and uh, or uh, developed another code which will take care of uh, uh, this different variations in the input parameters. So, it is based on Sri Priya's work and uh, she developed this SL chlore and uh, we are calling based on the uh, SSET test we can get the chloride threshold and then chloride diffusion can be obtained from ASTM C1556 or any other method uh, which is available basically ponding test and then also uh, the M value for which we are not considering any uh, uh, deviation. 
So, just a fixed number depending on the type of binder which we use and this is also another thing the limited there are limitations on the existing software where you cannot go beyond a particular number. So, here we are trying to cover different types of binder systems. So, with all these we developed several uh, you know CDFs cumulative distribution uh, uh, functions for different cases and then uh, generated many graphs like this then picked up various points from these graphs uh, and then developed a nomogram where if you want you can let us say I accept a probability of corrosion initiation of 0.2 in one case and then I start from here let me walk you through this nomogram. So, you have a probability of corrosion initiation then first I will see okay, what is my cover depth which is acceptable. So, let us say I use a cover depth of 50 mm and then from there I will see which is my chloride threshold and what is my m value, m value I can choose based on the binder which I have and then whichever chloride uh, threshold value for the particular steel cement tissue system you pick that and let us say you pick this curve uh, this uh, line 6 and from here you go down and then, then you can decide for achieving a particular life which type of concrete I should use. So, for example, here if you go from uh, if I pick this concrete a concrete with a diffusion coefficient of 1 e to the power of minus 12 if I use this for this cover depth and this failure probability and the particular uh, chloride threshold and m value picked up I can get a life of about 50 plus years. But if I uh, get a concrete which is poor of poor quality let us say it is 3 into 10 to the power of minus 12 then I get only life about 20 25 years. So, this can be used at the design uh, table or design phase where it is relatively simple than playing with the software and entering uh, all the input parameters. So, this is very easy for a, a design team to because everything all what we are told earlier has been built into this and a nomogram has been made. So, I think this will be a good tool uh, and so also we can also do another thing which is if you have a target life let us say service life is defined let us say you have a target life of 100 years. So, you go from there then you tell okay, what is the concrete which I want to or which I have want to use let us say I pick this concrete and then I have a chloride threshold of this. So, if I go from here and then I go to the top I hit here and then I can come here and then pick my cover depth sorry pick my cover depth so that I can decide whichever probability of failure or acceptable probability of failure. Uh, in other words here the probability of failure is probability of corrosion initiation. So, this can be used either clockwise or anti clockwise uh, for deciding on what type of material to be used uh, or selected or you can also define a target diffusion coefficient when you talk about new construction. And so, if I say for whatever case I can say that whatever concrete you use I should have a target diffusion coefficient of this thing uh, 2 into e to the power of minus 12. Then the people at site can actually work on getting that type of concrete or a concrete which has a diffusion coefficient of whatever is the defined number. So, you can decide what should be the target properties of the concrete. So, conclusion cost of corrosion is uh, very significant we spend about 4 lakhs of crores per year uh, which is very very high uh, number and then chlorides contribute significantly to the cost of corrosion and two main parameters which really influence the service life are chloride diffusion coefficient and chloride threshold and when you use corrosion inhibitors an appropriate dosage is very important it is not uh, otherwise you may see that the corrosion initiation might like the chloride threshold might be higher, but it may adversely affect the other properties of the concrete which is not a good thing. So, everything has to be tested before we start using corrosion inhibitors and uh, what is the dosage had to be decided. Then uh, for testing chloride threshold in uh, systems with OPC and systems with uh, corrosion inhibitors or a system with uh, highly resistive SEMs all the test uh, you know techniques do not work everywhere. So, you have to be able to choose a right method for different type of systems and then performance of coating is uh, uh, you know 
uh, will be achievable like coatings will perform only if uh, they are applied properly in other words the steel surface should be treated very well before you apply the coating whether it is on site or off site and then they sh the coated the rebar should be handled properly so that there is no uh, mechanical damage on the uh, coated surface otherwise the performance will not be as uh, expected and other thing is uh, the chloride threshold and diffusion coefficient should be con considered uh, before we choose the material or in other words we should look at the effect of the synergistic effect of both chloride threshold and diffusion coefficient on the service life uh, while choosing materials rather than deciding the material based on either only chloride threshold or only diffusion coefficient. Uh, with that I think that is it, thank you very much. So, the main message is uh, the when you talk about durability based designs you have to think both about concrete system and uh, the diffusion coefficient or the chloride ingress rate in the concrete system and the uh, chloride threshold for the steel cementitious interface. Thank you.